Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to say thanks a lot for coming on, man. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me. I was reading through your bio again this morning, like I told you, and it's just it's so fascinating. Like, it's interesting that, uh, and we'll get to it once you get to it, but there, you know, there's that Syria piece of it, which I haven't touched on yet on this, you know, the people that I've had on haven't haven't had that experience. So it's, I'm really interested about that because I haven't really heard a lot about it. But yeah, you run the whole gamut of, you know, being conventional at the fifth all the way to, you know, being at one of the most elite units that uh, this this country has to offer. So I'm really interested in hearing what you got to say. And um, yeah, so go ahead, take me take me from start to finish, and, and let me hear your story, man. Man, well, I appreciate that. And I I had heard a couple guys, you know, and, and seen this a few times with some of the some of the people you've had previously on here. And uh, you know, thank you for for even considering that. It's very uh, humbling to even you know be able to talk amongst some of these these legends and men including yourself because i know that you won't won't talk about yourself but uh you know it's guys like you that actually caused me to to join and go the directions that i did so you know i'd put it right back to you but you know uh starting out honestly i wasn't a i wasn't a person that was you know intertwined in military life or grew up with you know military family uh, you know, directly, I had some, you know, uncles and, and grandparents that served, you know, but it wasn't something in my daily life, always gravitated towards it, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't something that you were, you, you knew what it was really going to be like once you went to basic training and, and what a duty station was like, and that you could just move around from place to place. So, you know, kind of going back with that, it was, you know, started, uh, Started in, in high school, kind of had a love and affinity for all of those things. You know, I think like most teenagers did of just, you know, war movies and looking looking like, you know, cool guy stuff and all that. All right. Um, and then, you know, I went to college, pretty traditional path, uh, started and did about, you know, two pretty unimpressive uh, years into college that, uh, <laughs> you know, I spent a little bit more time not studying than, uh, than I should have. So, right. uh, you know, that sort of turned into... Uh, what am I really going to do with my, with my life? And right about that time was, was September 11th. And, uh, like, like everybody, you know, that we rerun in these circles with, it affected our lives pretty, pretty significantly. And it was, it was kind of a, you know, a turning point for me. Um, still took a little bit of time to understand what it was I wanted to do, but that was a, that was a pretty pivotal moment, you know, watching that unfold. I was, in my college dorm room and, you know, just woke up and, and saw that happen and, you know, just decided like, what, what's my real path and direction. So then it was sort of a start from there to kind of figure out what it is I wanted to do because I didn't really have any frame of reference of, you know, a service branch or, you know, when did any of these jobs did much less, you know, the soft community or having any understanding of that. So, right. So, you know, uh, during that time, we're really just kind of, bounced in between some landscaping jobs and, you know, doing this and that started a couple of things that I thought I could really build on as a career, you know, some in the, in the mortgage, you know, uh, sector and, and stuff like that. But you know, I just didn't really have that much fulfillment from it. And, uh, you know, kept kind of coming back to this, like, I think, I think there's a little higher purpose or something else that I'm supposed to be doing. So, so went in and, you know, did all of the, basic training stuff, you know, and, and, and all of that, you know, spent a little time on the delayed entry program and, uh, you know, just went in and basically waited my time until I got a spot. And I originally went in to you know, be a, be a combat controller originally, because the way that had happened is I had a, a close friend and his cousin was a controller. I don't even know his name to this day, but his cousin <laughs> was a controller, you know, and he's like, you got to talk to my cousin. So I, I basically just, you know, latched up with him for a cup of coffee you know he had cool guy hair and he was ripped and you know i was like yeah this is this is the dude i want to be you know like this, right. is, this is good you know like 18 year old 19 year old me so I'm like, well this guy seems to think it's awesome and you know we're gonna go do it so then i started doing the research and learning and you know obviously about the pipeline and and uh going through all of that stuff and it was uh you know, I was off to the races then. I, I wanted to do it, finished up basic, everything went good, and then went over to the NDOC course. And about that time, you know, not to be in too much detail, it's, uh, you know, the, it's one of the times that I really reflected on my life about making a life decision based off of other people, really, you know, because I yeah. was 
I was separated from a, from a girl, you know, that I wanted, you know, that's all I could do to, you know, be near and everything. And it was bit getting more tumultuous, more days went on and, you know, the distance and all that. And, you know, so I finished up the NDOT course at, at uh, Medina there next to Lackland. Right. And, and I, and I would just, you know, still, still think about it. I don't ever want to go back and say, what if, but, uh, cause, cause I couldn't ask for a better career the way that, you know, the family that I have and anything, but I think it's, uh, it's one time in my life and in my military career that I made a decision based off of someone else or, you know, wanting to relocate so I could get somewhere near. So it's sure. kind of a funny story that you, uh, you know, you, you move, you move to Hurlburt because that's a, there's another cool guy job there with tack P and that could be, you know, two hours from a, from a girl, you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, and you're like that looking back, you're like, Oh, what an idiot, you know, what a stupid <laughs> move. No, no regrets, you know, as they yeah, would say, yeah. <laughs> but it's still like, it's like, you know, so you think through that and all right, that's, uh, that's one thing that, that you always kind of go back to is how your life changed. But you know what, like, turning out to, to be a tack P to, uh, you know, the way that my life went after that. I mean, I would never change anything obviously, but, uh, but an interesting thing. So yeah. I still look back and say, that's the one thing in my military career that I, that I kind of quit, you know, yeah. and, and I quit it for the stupidest reason ever. <laughs> and so I just made a, I made a decision that like, we're not going to quit anything else, you know, cause yeah. it was, our, it was already just, you know, eating at me a long time that it was just a decision like that. So. Yeah. So, you know, that, uh, so that, that whole, that whole Medina Lackland thing, that seems like it lasts for two years in my mind, but it's probably like, you know, it's four months or something, right. you know, and you're just like, uh, so, you know, I, I have a couple other buddies that are deciding to, to go down and do, uh, do the tech PE thing as well. And, you know, they were, they were just, uh, you know, one, maybe a seer guy, a couple, you know, PJ guys, you know, people had just decided or, you know, got hurt and they had been over there and they're, you know, they're like, we're going to go do tag piece. So I felt like we sat in these dorms, just, you know, the students awaiting training, you know, like yeah. the, the SOT brigade, you know, and so you're just running <laughs> amok, you don't, you know, you don't have right. a job to do. So it's like going, doing details and, and, you know, just living in these dorms, just literally unattended, you know, so right. just running amok and the, the funny <laughs> stuff that came with that was, you know, always hilarious. So, so we all take the trip down to, down to the schoolhouse and, you know, that was a, that was a great experience, obviously, you know, and I think we had a really, really strong team coming through that and, and, you know, just nothing too crazy out of there. Uh, towards the end of our graduation, we had some had some funny events, uh, you know, one of our guys decided he was going to drive around a, a Humvee or something like that. And so that, that turned us into having to, you know, do a recall and everybody, you know, everybody came in and they, they pulled everybody out. And well, turns out I was out seeing, you know, this girl that I had wanted to be so close to, you know, yeah. and she was, she was out and my family was down cause it was like the day before graduation. So you're know, like, so it just, you know, spirals from there. Where's this guy? Where's this guy? And you're like, oh, Lord, this is funny. So, you know, a lot of heartache and a lot of push-ups that night. I think oh, I yeah, I'm sure. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you get through it, go do your thing. And and then, it, you know, it took us to the 5th ASOS. And, and I was actually supposed to go to Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, and... I, I just thought, you know, I, nothing against it. And, and actually there were like three or four instructors that were like, man, Fort Riley's great. You're going to love it. And, uh, I didn't have a huge preference. I wasn't like, Oh, I want to get back close to home or anything. I, that wasn't really a, really an option. Um, so I was like, wherever I'm going to go, I'm going to go, but I'm going to kind of want to make it somewhere that's maybe fits my lifestyle more than like, you know, mountainous or something like that sure. versus, you know, Kansas. Right. And uh, so a buddy of mine was from Oklahoma. He wanted to get a little bit closer to, to home. And uh, so he switched with me and I ended up, he had orders to, you know, Fort Lewis and Tacoma, Washington. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Tacoma, Washington. I thought it sounded kind of cool. And it was pretty, you know, rugged place up there. And, uh, you know, everybody says the unit was pretty decent. You know, half of them were, were half deployed and they were kind of kicking off into that. You know, this is probably in the 405 range. So oh, okay. in the Mosul days and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I just decided that let's switch it up and 
and it was kind of just off from there. So got up there, you know, did the seer time and all that stuff prior right, before right. showing up. But, uh, so, you know, got up there, uh, it was me and me and two other friends, good friend of mine, Reeves and, and Justin Metzger. And so we get up there and, you know, just, at least we kind of had each other cause it was a pretty <laughs> funny time. Uh, cause you know, there was a, there was an E4 mafia that was running around that place at the time. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was the old days when, uh, yeah. you know, you when know, hazing was frowned upon, you know, <laughs> so, right, right. <laughs> but never, n- nothing was ever happened with it. So, you know, you get there and, uh, you know, you're running around and I don't know, one of these nights they've got us down in the courtyard of the dorms and, you know, they've shaved off half our heads and we're covered and, you know, just whatever condiments could be, you know, found in the fridge and right. doing grassy gorillas and, and here comes, you know, security forces that this rolls us up and, you know, and of course all, all, the, all everybody else is scattered. So it's just three dudes, you know, just doing grassy gorillas in the, in the courtyard with mohawks and, you know, big notches taken out of their head. So hey, yeah. it's like, all right, here we go. You know, so yeah, there's a good picture of that in the police station that uh, oh, yeah. first, sergeant had, first sergeant had to come get us. And it was, it was a good time, but uh, you know, such is life. It was yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, so that was that we kind of went to our flights and everybody was, uh, you know, it was just a weird time, but I wouldn't say weird. It was just a, it was a motivated time. You know, the, yeah. we weren't, we weren't deep into the war where we were, you know, 10, 15 cycles of deployments at this point, it was still pretty new. And obviously Iraq was very new. So, right. you know, um, they were just deciding, you know, it, it was funny. I, you kind of, you kind of would ebb and flow with what the cool war was, you know, the cool war at my time was obviously, you know, to be able to get to go to Afghanistan was awesome, but you're like, Iraq, is that really what I, you know, is that the good war? And then they sort of flip flop as you yeah, get yeah. through, you know, as you get through the next 20 years, it's like, what's cool to go do, you know? And it's still, right. still kind of seems that way in a lot of ways, you know? And uh, so, you know, we get there and trying to figure out, you know, just work on the normal stuff as an airman does getting your, getting your CMR and all of these things and making sure you understand whatever your, your job is. And, you know, that's where I really met some influential people that are still, you know, I'm, I'm friends with today, you know, early on in, in that before we went and did a, you know, our first deployment and stuff. And so, you know, you're training up and you'd always see these, you'd always see these dudes that would pop in and out, you know, with, with their cool clothes on that they got at REI on the impact card and, and right. beards. And you're like, well, what do these guys do? You know? So well, who are these guys? And, uh, and so, you know, this was back before there was anything really like a affiliated 17th, you know, uh, mm-hmm. STS for sure. But even before, even before those Ranger flights were, you know, associated with the 17th. And so it was just like these guys that kind of, you know, lived, they had a little basement office down where vehicle maintenance was. And then they worked over on, obviously on the 275 compound most of the time, but they'd come in and they had this little, you know, broom closet. And, and this is like the days of, you know, you got all the Earls and BTs and, and just these guys, you're like, yeah, all right. So you're, you're walking around, you don't know what these guys do. They come in and, you know, rough you up a little bit, throw some knowledge at you and tell you yeah. you're dumb and walk away and you're like, oh, you know, yeah. these guys seem good, you know, so. So that develops into a much, you know, better relationship and, and friendship down the road and stuff. But, you know, it was like you would get glimpses. Obviously, they're busy. We're trying to get ready to do a big brigade deployment. So, you know, it's just a lumbering, not very agile movement to, to get in there with the Army. So, sure. So yeah, that, uh, that kind of takes us to our first, you know, my first deployment, honestly, and just... Uh, had no idea really what to think, you know, to be honest, it was just, uh, it's kind of like, you know, I felt good coming in to getting, you know, getting trained up, but didn't feel unprepared. But, uh, again, you know, it's one thing about being a TACP that I think is sort of, uh, goes unnoticed is that, you know, you got to be a person that can just assimilate into a team and not just assimilate into a team that can, to, to do a job, but, you know, you've got to really kind of get in there and be, you know, one of the guys, but also a key leader in a lot of ways, you know, and you're usually your, your rank is not doing you any favors because that's, right. uh, you know, generally lower than, 
than most on the army side for the for the level of responsibility that you're given so it's a little bit like um you know so getting in there and kind of learning that was a big piece for me of uh you know just assimilating with an army team and and uh, my first deployment was with uh, Mike Dunn. I don't know if you know him, but he was my JTAC. Uh-huh. And uh, so we bounced around and uh, he was he was a great you know leader and, and got me, you know, focused on the important things and knew when the dumb things were dumb and, you know, what we, what we could do with that. So he was uh, he was a good guy, uh, did did awesome work. And and it was just a, it's a pretty conventional deployment. And I don't say that in a bad way, but in that time, you know, we were just battle space owning. We were right. we you know, we were kind of target of opportunity, but. It was just, it was just owning terrain and mm-hmm. breathing air, you know? And so, <laughs> uh, this is right when things started getting extended. So we were, you know, supposed to do the six month thing. Cause we would break that up and do half of the year, you know, between flights or, uh, with the army, but that just, you know, they ended up, that's when they were sending people for 14, you know, 16 months at a time at that point. Yeah. And so we had to, uh, we had to extend, you know, another three months or something. So it ended up being 10 and a half months or something like that by the time it was done. But, you know, of course they wait till the two weeks before you're supposed to go home to let you know, you know, you're extending. (laughs) So those things, you know, of course. Just to make it really hit home, you know. (laughs) That's it. You know, but then you hear about these four dudes. Like I remember we had, we had these guys that were out of Alaska and I, I think they even got those guys all the way home and turned them around. Yep. Just landed and everything. I mean, yeah, that's, that's that's tough one, you know. Yeah, I got a buddy that was on that flight, and he was like, it was so demoralizing. You know, they they landed. And <laughs> I think he, I think he, they even got off for a little bit, and then they're like, all right, get back on, and they headed immediately right back. It was so crazy, man. And they stayed for another four or five it. months after that. I'm like, it's like <laughs> bananas. <know>. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh man. Yeah, that's a gut. That's a gut punch for yeah. sure. You know. So that was fine. So you know, anyway, it's like suck it up. It was, I guess, what we took away. We had a, we had a good, you know, month or so out of that that we, you know, went and did a little clearing operation, you know, and that kind of turned out to be my first, first taste of actual combat, you know, of actually like getting in a, in a shooting fight and, and, you know, understanding that, you know, rockets don't give you any time to react and stuff like, you know, how that, how that stuff really works is, uh, you know, you're at the mercy of, of, of the game at that point, you know, yeah. when you, when you kind of first realize, and I think everybody sort of has that first moment where they're like, there is no one around here. That's Superman. That's going to save me or us or anything. You know, we just, uh, we're kind of in this one together and you right. know, ride it out. So, so that was a good one. Um, you know, yeah, it, it was good to kind of get that experience under my belt a little bit, not feel like we went 10 and a half, you know, 11 months trying to, you know, just sitting there playing PlayStation, you know, so (laughs) it's kind of, at least you felt like you got something out of it, learned a lot about how the fires process and doing some of that stuff, you know, took place in, in a real conflict. So, yeah. Uh, you know, not a, not a great note, but it was a pretty tough day that day. The first time we kind of got in a conflict and that was actually the, the day that my grandfather passed away. And so I just happened to call my dad, hadn't talked to him or hadn't called basically in six, you know, probably four or five months, I guess it had been, you know, cause I just, we were just running off the Iridium sat right, phones. Right. There wasn't really Skype or anything. And we were really fortunate to have that sat phone, you know? So yeah. it was basically like, uh, yeah. So, so we would, we'd kind of trade that off, but of course they'd always be harping on us on minutes and stuff like that. Right. So you didn't have, you didn't have a way to just call everybody or Skype everyone you knew necessarily. So, um, uh, so called him and, you know, it was just sort of like it, one of those things where you just knew. And he, he was always, uh, he was very influential, like in the, in the military, I say that, but he was a pilot that, um, you know, he was kind of affiliated with some of the, some of the do little stuff. And he did some B-25 stuff out of, in Hawaii. And, um, you know, he wasn't one of the, one of the Raiders, but just, you know, it was always a very, uh, close piece to him and, and flying and being a pilot. So one of the early members of, army air corps and stuff like that so uh i just thought it was an interesting thing you know and it was obviously a difficult day but uh an interesting thing that kind of like you almost felt like you had somebody there with you you know additional and uh, i felt like that 
more than a few times, you know, now, uh, you know, le leading up to more and more of these events. There's some days that you're just like, you know, there's definitely somebody looking after you, you know, sure. in this situation. So, so I kind of looked at him as kind of my, you know, he passed that day and I just felt like it was kind of my, my guardian angel looking, you know, looking at us from there. So, and the, sure. yeah, so it's been it's pretty interesting coincidence yeah. and then called my dad and, you know, talked to him that day. So it was interesting. It really was. So yeah, we, uh, we, we packed up ship from that, you know, and it was, uh, it was just, you know, kind of a notch in the belt, you know, you sort of get back and you're the young senior airman or A1C, you know, with, I got a combat patch on for third right. grade. You know, you're walking around like, what else do I need to do in life? You know, like, I'm good. <laughs> exactly. you know? So, so you, you uh, came back and and uh, I had known from that experience, like, well, I want a little bit more out of this. Like, you know, this was this was good. I don't I, I love I think I love the military, but uh, I don't want to go and play PlayStation for nine months and get into fun stuff for a month and call it good. You know, right. Uh, there's gotta be something a little bit better. And so I, that's when I started getting a little bit more and, and I wasn't even a JTAC on that first deployment. So, you know, it was really just watching, you know, you're yeah. just watching and helping and facilitating and, uh, and, and learning, learning at that point. But, uh, so focused on getting that, uh, pretty much right when I got home, I think I got to go to airborne school and then, and then went and uh, went to JTAC, you know, QC down in Nellis uh, pretty quickly after that. And, uh, you know, that was trying to think if there's anything of note there. But, you know, it was pretty pretty much kind of a heads down time. Um, but right around that time, I was really starting to talk to, uh, you know, Earl and BT and and, you know, it was Tink and, and Zach and, you know, all of these guys that you're just like what do I got to do to be here? Because I yeah. think I could really do this a long time. I don't know if I can do this, you know, uh, you know, just kind of long mundane deployments, but yeah. you know, from what I hear and, and they were kind of doing some, you know, a lot of augmentee stuff at that point, because there just wasn't enough, you know, controllers to go around, you know, JTAX as a whole to go around. Right. And so it was in that weird time where Manning was a real issue and, and they just would either want, uh, you know, a lot of augmentees for either the Rangers or for the 2-2, two -two, you know, to mm -hmm. go support the ODAs over there. And so it was a lot of plug and play, but I was still very young and they had no way to tell, you know, what I was going to do in a situation <laughs> right. like that. So it was like a little bit like, you know, we hear you, but, uh, you know, just uh, <laughs> sit there for a little longer, yeah, we'll, yeah. you know, we'll see. And, and, uh, and this is really before there's any actual, you know, assessment and selection it's so right. professionalized now and i think i think that's a great thing sure uh for sure to make us better and, and create a better better product down the road but it's night and day of what it was oh yeah you know back in the day i was like yeah i mean you you know exactly it's like is that dude good yeah he's awesome he's good let's <laughs> right you know we'll give him a shot they go make him ruck around the flight line you know 45 <laughs> times with a jerry can and and yeah. then we'll put him in the simulator and you know, and then we'll go, go have some drinks with him, make sure he's not a bonehead. And, uh, right, right. you know, and that's about it. It's kind of like, you know, you, you do a little proving yourself, but it's really just, you know, kind of the, the old days were pretty good old day word of mouth, you know, good old boy word of mouth type of thing. And, uh, with a little yeah. bit of validation, but they kind of knew the product they had. Uh, right. Right. Coming yeah. A lot of it was it, a yeah. right place, right time. Also. I mean, if you were at the fifth or if you were at, you know, third brigade, third ID at Benning, or, you know, maybe, or third brigade, or th excuse me, third ID over at Savannah, then that was, yep. that was, you know, it was easy to get over there. But if you weren't in those locations, it was kind of, it was really tough to get into the 17th yeah, at that time. Like, yeah, for sure. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to PCS to another, you know, conventional unit just to wait your time and try to get in with those guys. So I, <laughs> right. I think about that a lot. If I didn't, you know, if I would have stayed at, at Fort Riley as my first duty assignment, you know, it would have changed the whole trajectory. I just don't think you, you don't get the opportunity to be there and, and meet those guys that then say, you know, this is a guy we want to bring over. It right. just wouldn't happen. So, right. And so I think that we do get a, we get a better range of people that can assess. Now, obviously I think the process is, you know, t a thousand times more <laughs> right. professionalized and standardized, uh, yeah. but it was, it's kind of good to look back and say like, you know, 
because all in all, we still did. I think we produced some of the, you know, some great people from that. Oh yeah, don't system. get me wrong. The the guys that were brought over yeah. were, I mean, phenomenal guys. I mean, especially when, in my experience, you know, most of these guys were, you know, they came from Third ID. They were just like super heavy hitters and just phenomenal guys. Exactly. You know, it's all basically about where you where you might end up at any given time. And uh, right. So I didn't really. I had seen some of these some of these guys, you know, get these uh, augmentee things, and you know, they'd come up to the flight and they'd have their they'd have their Manila envelope with their orders that they're trying to be all super secret, you know, but they wanted <laughs> yeah. everyone to know they got some Ranger augmentee orders right. or something, you know, like you're like, what's about, what's this all about, you know? So I kind of wanted to figure this out. So so ended up going and. Uh, I never really would have thought that I wanted to be. So you basically just went and did this like fifth ASOS, you know, Ranger flight assessment. I don't even mm -hmm. know who held it. I don't know who, <laughs> I mean, I know who was there smoking you and putting you through the, right. through the simulator, but I don't know who made a final determination of, uh, of, you know, this guy's going to get orders over here. It was right. just, kind of just happened, you know, and, yeah. and the, I know that some things were happening down at HQ at Benning to right around this time to sort of consolidate and actually make us part of the 17th. And I know like Matt had a big, a big play in that to, oh, yeah. to get that done. So, I mean, yeah, so it was all really happening, but to a young senior airman, I'm like, just tell me where to show up. I just want right. to do this. And, <laughs> and I never thought that I would be, uh, you know, it was kind of at this point, it was like, what well, do you want to go do the SF thing or you want to go do the Ranger thing? And I'm just my whole life. I'd all thought like, well, I'm, I'm kind of a baseball cap and, uh, you know, long hair kind of guy. I'm a, I, I want to go support SF, you know, yeah. cause all I knew was they were, they had all the cool stuff and small teams and doing this and, um, and long hair and, you know, the cool beards and, and all I thought about Rangers was, you know, three, three finger high and tights and, uh, you know, just misery, you know, yeah, just yeah. how much can we be in misery? Well, <laughs> you know, come to find out, uh, you know, luckily, luckily we had that talk, you know, myself and Earl and, uh, and BT, and they just said, you know, like, you know, come in this room. It was kind of an informal read on like, you yeah. know, th this is, this is what you you would do here. Uh, you know, it's your decision, but they really kind of, you know, gave you the, the informal read on of what it is you're doing, just the, the focus that, uh, you know, I had no clue about, I had no right. clue how they supported. I had no clue how they were affiliated. You know, I just knew that they were like pretty awesome, you know, infantry raiding force, you know, right. the, but, but how broad and, and is that? And, and I obviously had no clue how they would fit into the next, uh, you know, 15 years of, uh, you know, counterterrorism and, and what they've accomplished in the next, right. you know, in the last, the last few decades. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, but so that was the, the bit eye opening so that it wasn't, you know, three finger high and tights and it wasn't, <laughs> you know, marching around and, and, uh, you know, cause I, I just thought, well, that's just not really me and come to find out, you know, uh, so they kind of geared me in that direction. I think it was probably one of the best, uh, best decisions I made just from the, the people that I got to meet relationships. But, uh, that was a, that was a pivotal moment for, for BT to kind of sit me down and be like, you know, give me the ins and outs of what was real and, uh, you know, what, what was perceived and yeah. otherwise, you know? Yeah. They changed a lot. When I first got there, it was like that. Like it was very, you know, rigid and everything was, you know, spits and starches and all the Rangers had high and tights and, it, it, yeah, I don't, the discipline and the, um, the energy didn't leave it. They just kind of changed their tactics a little bit to be a little more, I, I guess maybe to stand out a little less, you know, you know, to kind of be able to do things yeah. without being such a, cause I mean, when you saw those guys, I was like, Oh, those are Rangers. And it was indisputable who they were. Now they're, yeah. they were starting to get into things where they didn't necessarily want that to happen. So yeah, it, it was and it in the mission set changed a little bit, but uh, yeah, there's, I can't say enough about those guys. I mean, they're, they're, it's such a phenomenal, you know, I'm so glad that you, you know, BT set you down because not that SF is a bad mission. That's a phenomenal mission, but, um, I just, absolutely. You know, some people don't have the, some people have the misconception about the Rangers and, and they're like, Oh, that's going to be too hard or it's, you know, it's too stringent or whatever, but it's, it's a phenomenal place to serve for sure. It's I, I'm, I, you know, I can honestly say that if anything that I did prior or, or, to this point in my life, 
it's the most elite organization that I have ever worked in, you okay. know, and, and, and being able to be, a, it's just not even a question. Like, <laughs> right. you know, they, they conduct themselves in, in a great, in such a great way. Uh, you know, it's just building leaders from a young age uh, up to an, you know, to, to an older age where they can, you know, be effective over a wider span of people. But, right. you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely the pinnacle of my career, you know, uh -huh. to, to be able to be there with them. So, uh, yeah, yeah. same here. <laughs> So, yeah, and, you know, I think looking back the way that we've gone from, uh, you know, the way that we've moved to, you know, the way that we support the SF mission now as TACPs and JTACs, you know, I don't, that doesn't necessarily have the, the longevity, you know, longevity in the, in the SF world. And you kind of had these, these kind of divergent paths where I think that there's a, there's a pretty, you know, clear great path to be able to go as a TACP and get into soft and stay into soft for a long time and support, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Rangers, um, where I think, you know, had I gone that there was a lot of bifurcations and how that path would have worked out with, you know, being an SF TACP and, right. you know, all of those things. So, you know, overall I thought it was, it, it, I look back and it was a, it was a great decision to do sure. that. So, you know, and then the hard part starts because then you're right. like, exactly. I have, <laughs> I'm a I'm a zero deployment JTAC senior airman, you know, went over there, you know, you just don't know shit from Shinola at this point, you know, and you're you but you think you do and you and you get to wear your cool hiking boots and and you're it, you know, you're loving life and you're I just remember, you know, getting over there and doing like my first TFT, you know, just was you know, validation exercise, I guess. And and we're out there, we go out to Campbell and you know I had never walked under NVGs before, you know, I mean, so, so, and so I'm sitting down and I'm supposed to, I think I was actually following, maybe it was BT or maybe it was uh, Jeremy Bowling. I can't remember. It was either BT or Jeremy. And so now they've got this guy like snap link to him, you know, basically. <laughs> and it's just like, just shut up and just look at what I do, you know, right. walk where I walk, <laughs> don't say words, you know? And yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, Roger, we got this. So I got these NVGs on and, and this, this training, you know, they, and I think it wasn't Campbell, it was up in Knox and they put so oh, yeah. much money into this thing. It's unbelievable. So, you know, there's rockets flying and there's, there's GBS is going everywhere and it's, you know, it's awesome, but you know, we're walking in and there's just log after log and the, you know, and I mean, I just, I just eat it, you know, I eat it and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, with, I'm like the only other Air Force guy, and Jeremy's just, what are you doing, dude? You know, so I, I eat it like the first time. Wham! You know, NVG smash against my face. Just cut, you know, lay me open here. <laughs> so, so I just get to the, you know, I get to the target. I'm like, wow, this is really cool, but man, that hurt a lot. You know, just, <laughs> so I just bleeding down my face, and you know, just, just a goon. You know, just yeah, yeah. A total goon. And I wish I could say that that was the first and the last time that I, that these sorts of things happened. But to be honest, you know, for that full train up, you know, and training cycle, it's like the lear the learning curve to, to actually be a good jumper, to actually be, you know, self-sufficient and to pack your air packs, to walk under NVGs, to, you know, to know your kit, the way that you have to, in like such a dismounted way in the dark and, yeah. Uh, you know, cause you don't, you, you just don't do anything. So anything you do, you have to do under MBGs and you have right. to, you have to do it in the dark or with, you know, kind of with your eyes closed. So, uh, that was a learning curve, you know, yeah. and, and the many, many times, you know, I felt like I had the two best JTACs in the world, you know, the three or four best JTACs in the world that, that cared enough to take me into that sim and, and run me through the dirt and, you know, and, and getting, getting prepared. And I think, you know, later down in, in this story, it, you know, I, I come back to that a lot because, uh, they, they took the time and, and it's a dynamic event when, you know, a, a ranger force needs to have, you know, needs some JTAC support. It's a quick, and you can kind of happen so fast. You're like, well, I, I did it, you know, I did it right. It kind of worked out, you know, like no one's dead, you know, bad guys are, you know, out of here. And so it's uh it just happens so fast. And so yeah. I think for them to train you that way and, and to put the time in. Um, so, you know, we go through that and we're doing a couple jumps that, that cycle. And I think uh, my first jump with my, with my new platoon 
you know, and I get in there and it's all going good. We were, you know, setting up and I forget. I, I don't blame it on the jump master at all. I, I forgot to hook up my lowering line. I know this, you know, for a fact. And so, and I just sort of, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know to, it's like one of those lessons learned. Like now, every time when you had a lower line, you give that thing a tug, you know, right. and, it, and check it, you know, before you go. And uh, so I get out and I'm like, okay, that's a good jump. I'm under canopy and just go to lower my equipment. You know, it makes that zzz for like three seconds and wham, you know, and you feel it. And that yeah. thing just went zzz and just no. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. i like, you know, so luckily, I mean, it was a serious thing. You're like, this is. This is a bush league business, you yeah. Know, but yeah, it's kind of out there flapping, I guess. Is, yeah. the, is the did you ever moral find it? Of the story? So. Oh yeah, right down below me. No, this was actually a. This turns out this was like a day jump. So, oh okay. You know, God and country saw this whole thing burn in, and I'm just you know, <laughs> so, it wasn't anything I could hide or like. Oh, oh yeah, my rucksack broke. No, that thing disintegrated, you know. Oh, man. But I would say that the radios did survive. It was kind of awesome. But, oh, uh, nice. Oh, man. Yeah, so just, <laughs> so you know, just a, just a bonehead, you know. A lot yeah, of things yeah. to learn. A lot of things to learn and just drink it from a fire hose, you know. Oh, so, for sure. So we get up to our, uh, kind of up to the first deployment. And uh, it's me and Easy, uh, Rodriguez, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go to the same place. And, you know, I feel very uh, fortunate that I've got, you know, he's a very experienced guy. Yeah. He was kind of in with the with the, with the the platoon that we were working with or the company that we were working with. And uh, so it was a nice transition. But it was one of those where we went to, it wasn't exactly what I expected because we were like, you know, you're going to Iraq again. And I'm like, okay, well, at least it's something that I'm semi familiar with and, and not, uh, you know, totally different and dismounted through the mountains and, and things like that. So, uh, but it turned out to just be, you know, heart of the city. And back when it was just like, you guys don't have anything to do tonight, go bang two targets, you know, and it wasn't like, just go hit one. It was like, get in the vehicles. You know, we weren't doing a bunch of the stuff flying around at that time it was just get in the vehicles and then go go hit this one we'll probably call you with a follow-on and you know so we ended up just doing you know two or three missions and then or you know they'd get back and you know we had basically two two jtacs between three platoons and and then some partner yeah. force that was doing the same thing so we'd get off the helicopter or get off a vehicle and go do another one you know yeah. and and you're talking like, you know, 10, 12 hours and it's not walking through Afghanistan. So, you know, it's manageable, but you're still, still having uh, to learn new stacks and you're having to, you know, not carry over things from the other one, just as far as like, what are my assets? And, and they would always be generally the same, but it was great repetition for me to be able to just, uh, you know, just get hitting targets down and, right. And what that targeting cycle looks like and how we do it and what we do and and uh, just go through the paces. And so, you know, we ended up doing probably about a hundred. It was like a hundred, hundred and ten, uh, you know, hits in in that very short deployment window that we do, of you know, about as many days. And so it was great to get not very dynamic, you know, not uh, as far as that goes, which, again, I felt pretty thankful for. I felt. I was prepared to go on this deployment, but, uh, you know, how prepared are you until you get into that situation and, and sure. find out? So not, not very dynamic as far as, you know, uh, uh, intense, um, situations, but, uh, so it was a great, it was a great lead up, got a lot of experience to be able to, to just get those movements under my belt and, yeah. you know, almost like a nice rehearsal before you have to get into something <laughs> later. Before you go <laughs> do the real thing, you know, just <laughs> like, and, and, you know, there's just so many things to try and teach a guy. It's like, you know, go put, go set up an HLZ over there, you know? And you're like, yeah. huh, all right. You know, like, <laughs> right. let's, go, let's go do that, you know? Like, <laughs> and you're just the whole time, you're like, just don't show your ass, you know? That's yeah, all you exactly. care about. Like, represent your guys well and take care of them. But, you know, it. you knew how to do it, but you had never really done it in the sure. dark. And that you're like, you know, this is a, we've got staggered terrorist, you know, palm fields and stuff you're like i don't want to burn in some helicopter trying to pick us right. up you know not a good first day you know so <laughs> no <laughs> so 
you know, that was great. Uh, it was a great, it was a great workup. And then we kind of got, you know, into more of the, you know, uh, the next one, you know, so I ended up maybe, do, uh, maybe doing five trips or so, and I'm going to have to go through all of them at all. But, uh, the next one was, uh, it towards, towards, uh, like South, you know, in Helmand of Afghanistan. And so we, uh, we, we went out there doing, that was about right at the time of like the Marja offensive that the Marines were doing. So that was when the, when they were doing that and like Lash God and, uh, and, and Marja offensive. So, and it was getting pretty nasty around there. You know, they were at, they had a bunch of, uh, you know, triple a and stuff that they were pulling out and shooting at the Cobras and, you know, the Marines were having quite a time with it down there and it was, it was pretty dynamic. So, you know, we were really just kind of tasked uh, to, to flow around there and do some harassing stuff and look for some of the triple a stuff and, you know, God forbid anything that was a little bit more powerful that they were really scared of, you know, for the, for the helos and stuff to just enable their freedom of movement. Um, you know, minimally dynamic, I would imagine nothing. uh, It wasn't anything where we were in serious, uh, but, but it gave me that taste of Afghanistan and the differences, you know, a lot of half, you know, a lot of halves helicoptering in stuff, which I didn't get a ton of exposure with. Hey. on uh, on the on the you know first one in, in iraq so uh so that was good just kind of building it building it up to you know whatever it is that would you know come at us the, the, the next time but uh not super eventful great group of guys that was my first exposure with the first, with the platoon that i would basically stay with the whole time uh from here on out so i kind of switched over between that iz to to uh afghanistan one and then kind of stayed with that platoon the whole rest of the time. And, uh, you know, best, best go- group of guys I've ever met. So, uh, yeah. So after that one, um, uh, that's that. And so we got back from that trip and it was only about a month or so that we had home. And then they did, a, you know, they did a kind of a call you back, uh, just to, it turns out that they had made a decision and, uh, I think this this is around when sort of the like Petraeus was sort of getting into that position and taking over uh, okay. around that time, and so they made like a decision that they wanted you know they they had some study or whatever and it was basically like we don't have freedom of movement for just our standard battle space owners you know um, uh, around and and we can draw a heat map of where we can't even get in and walk and. And so they, they came up with this idea that, well, we'll just send Rangers right into this hottest heat spot to just <laughs> get them in there and just try to kill everybody in there and uh, and give give the battle space owner some freedom of, of maneuver, you know, so they can at least drive through some of these towns because, you know, they were they were straight no go zones. And right. That's not really stuff you see on the news and stuff, you know, like who would have ever think like, oh, the Marines just don't go there because it's one, it's not strategically worth it. And two, they're going to lose three or four guys to IEDs. And I mean, this is the IED threat that I've never even experienced before. It was so, you know, absurd uh, at this point down there south. And so uh, so we went and we did this and, you know, uh, basically they just put a couple of teams, you know, a couple of Ranger platoons together. And uh, we went and uh, it was kind of an undetermined amount because we were obviously going out prior to, uh, you know, prior to the uh, to the actual window in which we were supposed to leave Mm -hmm. and uh, just said, you know, you guys, you guys are going to fall in on this, you know, mission and then probably go out through the duration of what our normal one would be. And then we'll, you know, all redeploy at the same time. And so, yeah. And so it was just, uh, you know, so that turned into about six and a half months of a, of a rotation, which, uh, you know, when you're going pretty hard, that's a long deployment. There's a reason those deployments are, you know, like, it's like when you're just going, but it was totally different in the way that we weren't sitting there going to hit targets and hit them and hit them and hit them every day or every other day. This was a very deliberate thing. So we would, you know, we would kind of, and we got the opportunity to go over. I mean, we were in every region of Afghanistan throughout that time from, wow. from far North to far West, East to the South down, and then the helmet all the way out to Nauzad, you know, like on the border basically. And so it was just basically, you know, kind of at the, 
at the general's spot. You know, these guys would sort of confer and they'd say, where do we, where do we think that we have a huge, you know, enemy population and, and no freedom of movement? And, and we would plan for a couple of days, you know, usually plan for a week or week or so plus for these. And, and we'd, it wasn't like, let's just go in there half cocked and, you know, but we, so we'd go in there with a couple of platoons and um, basically dig in all night and make, you know, gun ports and mortar firing pits and put up an American flag in the center of this like Taliban heartland. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, and then kind of like poking comes, them and seeing what happens. It's saying, hey, we're here, and yeah, <laughs> that was it, you know. And so we'd have a couple of guys that were, you know, they'd go out and hit a couple, you know, a couple of NAIs just to stir up the pot a little bit and get the radios going on the on the on their side and let them know we were there. And then and then you know we're just loaded for bear. So we you know you got two full platoons and you got all the attachments and of course like you know we got airplanes stacked up for for days into the. <laughs> you know, in the yeah. end of the atmosphere, you know, right. and, uh, and so then you kind of play the cat and mouse game and you could see when they would be bold and, and when they would come out. But, but, you know, starting at the beginning of doing that, because you knew you were going into it at that point, you knew that you were going to get in a gunfight, you know, pretty considerable. And, and you had to like, kind of keep the initiative from the beginning because sure. a couple of times we sort of lost the momentum as I kind of, you know, see it. And, and if you start to lose that, you know, things can spiral quickly. So if you keep the screws on them immediately, you know, overpoweringly, they would generally, they would generally fight, but it wouldn't be where you're in, you know, you feel like you're out of control of, right. of the situation, you know, and that happened a couple of times for sure. Cause just, you know, things happen, but, um, you know, the first time I really actually got to sort of use the, you know, use little birds and actually use fires to do my job was really in that, you know, person to person or, or as far as, you know, on the ground controlling. And uh, so it just sort of happened so quickly because, you know, we, we sort of were expecting that this was going to get bad. You know, it was so bad that the, you know, it was part of the fighting season. So all of these, all these dudes, they would just live in the trenches, the Taliban guys, they lived in the hedgerows and, yeah. and so they'd have like a little base camp but they'd come in and that they had like little camps deep in these hedgerows and i mean you could just kind of go through and and see it and you know they try to soften it up but i mean it was so many people in these areas that they had just flushed in to kind of control this town that yeah. uh that they were just living in the hedgerows you know yeah. and they were they're pretty loaded up ready to go and so <laughs> so you know probably one of my favorite things about you know just being able to to work with the with the 160th guys was you know we were just given authorization that uh when we were coming in they were just full guns weapons free so they when we would say you know get a minute out they would the mini guns would start and they would not stop until they took off and flushed away into the head because wow. it was just that many so they just did it as a deterrent like sure don't even mess around you know but it was it, you know, it's like, and then you don't, you don't get that often. Like even no. when you're doing other, you're like, that's a, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, that's a once in a lifetime thing. And we have yeah. this TTT where they're like, we're not going to risk it. And so they would just go, you know, both guns on either side as hard as they could go. And, uh, for, for two solid minutes until you know, we get in and get, and they'd get out with us. And you just remember seeing them, you know, flush and just blazing. And, and they were, you know, they would take a lot of fire uh, as well. So it was yeah. for good reason. For they, sure. Oh, yeah. They were getting lit up pretty well. So, yeah. so yeah, we, you know, we got there and uh, landed. And all of a sudden, you know, I look up and we've done a fire mission, you know. And I, it, you know, thank God I had some of the greatest pilots in the world because it was like, hey, man, I got some. I know exactly where you guys are. I got some definite bad guys right here. And they're coming over here. They got, you know, I could see their see their Russian made guns and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know, it gave him clearance. And he's like, you know, three seconds later, burp, you know, gone. And I'm like, wow, that was, uh, that wasn't as hard as I thought it would be, you know? So, and it's yeah. just, it sort of flies by, flies by on you sure. a little bit. And you're like, well, now we're, now we're in it. And we've, we've kicked the dust off and popped the cherry a little bit here and we're ready to go, you know? So, yeah. so then, uh, you know, those, those events started to really uh, unfold and we got better at it. And also we got to places that got, 
that were really good and 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 we're going to defend that that space and it would irritate the hell out of them that we would we would put uh, american flag up in their territory sure. so um <laughs> you know we had a lot of ser- you know pretty serious events but uh you know there was uh there was one our our eod guy uh who's now who's now a congressman now uh good dude brian mass but he was with us and uh he was leading out with one of our recce guys and uh just a very odd situation so you know we landed and they had basically gone over uh gone over a little wall and then came back over he actually had been over and i think i think they're this, the recce guy had been over as well, and he actually stepped back over it and hit a pressure plate. And, uh, oh, you know, man. I was probably, probably 50 yards away. And, uh, you know, he, he lost his legs in that event. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think in a lot of ways it was a very obviously a formative event for him. But, uh, you know, that be, being in that situation where you're trying to, you know, get this guy off. That was most catastrophic injury that I had ever, you know, seen visibly. Yeah. And so you're trying to get him buttoned up. And, and luckily we, we sort of knew that this was a very high threat area. So the birds had stayed, uh, they didn't flush and go back to base. They literally stayed for the first 10 or 20 minutes, very, very close in case this exact thing happened. And, uh, so we were able to call him right back and, uh, and, you know, get him on in a matter of minutes, which, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, Not speaks good. to the character of him and how that guy's, uh, the resiliency that, to to get well and, and do all of these things and then go on to, you know, serve and serve in Congress. Is, oh, is for sure. Impressive. But, you know, being there with him and talking about that story, uh, now, you know, it, being able to kind of go back and remember what I remembered and, and, you know, uh, trying to gather up all the pieces of him, you know, and get them back in one place, you know, and him still, oh you know, trying to stay in the fight was, uh, was incredible. You know, it's yeah. incredible, incredible resiliency to, to get back from that. So, uh, you know, that was a very serious time in that, uh, leading up, that was probably the most significant thing. And we had a couple guys that had, uh, stepped on some, you know, small little foot mine stuff and not to, you know, down, not, not to downgrade it, but that was a, catastrophic event but we had had a couple guys shot up to that point and uh yeah. you know one guy had lost his foot but it was you know it the the environment was just so ridiculous with yeah. with the ied the ied threat was just crazy so you know we'd get to where we'd just land and shoot these you know these little mini micklick things these little teeny backpack things with a rocket they were just the small like apob little things and that would shoot the little rocket with a deck cord and that'd give us 50 yards to walk you know and and then we (laughs) put another one down and we do it again and you're like this is stupid you know like what are we doing here yeah and uh so you know kind of got through that situation but you know a couple couple of good uh good solid firefights come out of that deployment for sure with uh you know with doing that mission and and with those dudes because it would just you know you'd go for all you go all day basically so you just uh you'd land and they'd start in the morning and they'd start kind of harassing and and uh you know a couple we just certainly would go all day and all day and uh you know we had a we had a 175 uh mortar team and uh well it was it was the team was really 275 but we had a couple of of leaders uh you know lance vogler was with us when he uh when he was was hit in that uh that deployment. So he was a 175 guy that was that was attached to us as a uh, as a mortar, you know, platoon leader mm-hmm. and uh, as a mortar team leader, excuse me. And so he he basically uh, we kind of started getting into it. And, and this guy, you know, we were we were taking these rounds that were that were, you know, Russian grenades. And and this somebody was just hiding really well and we just couldn't find him. And the guy just dialed this right in in the compound you know so yeah. you can only hide 70 guys in a even if <laughs> right. it's a big compound like there's dudes in the compounds that are just kind of st- you know in the corners or man and gun ports and stuff and and this dude that's you know this dude had us dialed in you know with these and so they just started started laying them in and uh and you know it was again you know it goes back but i was sitting there just right there in the courtyard right where you know, they landed and I just kept thinking like, 
it's really quiet, you know, and I just kept getting this feeling of like, get up, you know, you, you need to get up and get, move away from this, this open space. And I mean, five, five seconds after kind of getting through there, you know, we took a, we took a pretty direct hit, you know, so we took about three, three fully, you know, in the compound with, with people all around hits. And then, you know, we started trying and respond just by dropping as, you know, as much as we could uh, to get them to stop. But in this time, you know, Lance had taken his team out and, and gotten into the mortar pit to respond, get some immediate suppression fire. Problem is, this, you know, this guy was pretty dug in, didn't know where this was coming from. Sure. But he had us dialed in for sure. So they're going out to just do a, you know, and so I just remember him getting out there and leading this team out there and, and you know, sitting there in the wide open and, uh, you know, another one hit that was just, you know, dead dead honest basically and uh that hurt i think that ended up wounding maybe maybe 18 or 20 guys with that one thing because it was so you know and uh and obviously lance took took a fatal shot on that one and uh you know despite everybody trying their best to to get them but uh you know it just speaks to just speaks to the leadership you know he's just doing what he perceives as an ordinary thing but like you know so uh yeah, he's always always an interesting uh, story, and and he was he was on sixteen or seventeenth deployment, you know. I'm like, just, you know, this, you just you know, it's like you go back and interview somebody. That's the guy you interview. Like that's yeah. un, unheard of, and you know, pretty amazing. So it just speaks to Ranger. I mean, that's that's what they do. I mean, they don't they don't they disregard their own safety to do the mission, and it's like it's very commendable. You know, it's just it, that, that's the kind of caliber of guys you were working with at the time you know just awesome it's guys. unreal yeah it's just unreal and there's i mean i i you know you feel like you feel like a wimp half the time because <laughs> you know you're like you know it's things start kicking off and they're like well you, you know and it, it's just it's just their instinct and it's yeah. just it really is and you think like i don't want to go out there right now you know <laughs> right. like and you know this is not good right, right. this is really bad situation and I don't want to go walk over there or I don't want to, you know, this or that. And your body's tell your mind's telling, you know, in the, in these guys just let their courage take over. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, to, to watch them operate. And it, it shows you, you know, what, what real courage is, you know, so, For sure. yeah, pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, that deployment was, uh, was, was pretty interesting. Um, you know, a lot of near misses, a lot of, a lot of, uh, just basically kind of, you know, everybody was getting nicked up. I think we left there with, you know, 50 or 60 guys, you know, wounded yeah. and got, some, you know, purple hearts awarded and, you know, a lot of awards and stuff like that. And, uh, and they just, uh, you know, so it was, it was very dynamic, extremely formative on how to conduct yourself in these situations and and you get there you know when when you're done with that event you just think like wow i'm uh i don't think that there's a situation when it comes to jtac and that that i can't handle i mean you feel like you're just you're seasoned and and ready for all of it you oh know? And for it, sure and we got a little taste of all of it so to me that was that was definitely the pinnacle of of, of how I felt about my abilities and, and even the platoon itself was such a well-oiled machine at this point. I mean, yeah. everybody knew exactly what they needed to do. And it was like, I would put that force up against anything, you know, like oh, it, yeah. just, it was incredible to see that, the how, how seasoned and, and well-oiled they became, you know, throughout these kind of trials and, and getting better and better, you know? So yeah, uh, that was, that was pretty cool. So so, you know, from there on, uh, you know, redeployed and, you know, rinse and repeat, went back and, and did a couple of more, which were, uh, you know, the biggest thing about the rest of those couple of deployments after those were, uh, you know, we lost Chris Domey, which was, uh, you know, very, it was just a, it was just a, a, a situation where you might as well have just had a, a Greek God as far as the, the army JTACs and, and even all the Air Force JTACs were just like, you know, there was just a, there was just an aura about his abilities, you know, and yeah. and Chris and I had a had a good relationship, but it was funny at times, you know. I was kind <laughs> of a new guy, and you know, and um, 
as far as he was concerned and things like that. And he, yeah. and he was obviously a great ability, but uh, you know, losing him was, uh, it was a gut punch for the whole team. And uh, you know, my wife and, and Sarah were, were pretty good friends. And so, you know, it just really reverberated through the whole, you know, forward and in the rear. And so she's trying to help and console in any way, you know, a situation that's impossible. And, uh, you know, we've got our guys, 17th guys that are going to fill in basically to take over uh, because, you know, now we have this void, you know, to cover down and, right. and, uh, and then to see the army guys just, uh, you know, is that they lost their leader, you know, sure. and, and they did, you know, rightfully so. And so that was a, that was a difficult time to sort of get through and keep everybody, focused and uh but it to me it it uh you know it sort of changed something in my mind of just thinking you know like now i I had experienced lance before that at you know 14 deployments and i and then you know chris was going on i think you know 12 or 13 at this point and and i just think to myself i'm like man like you know i started to have children on the way i'm like you know you, you roll the dice too many times you know, you're going to get snake eyes and I, that's not to deter anyone from what they do or the sacrifice they make. It's, it's superhuman. But, uh, you know, me personally, I just thought like, what else do I really want to, what do I want to prove doing this mission? You know, uh, or what, what else do I want to accomplish? Not really sure. prove, but what do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? Um, a lot of that platoon was sort of moving on because the turnover is high and, you know, most leadership's out in a couple of years. And, um, I just thought it was a pretty good time after that you know, last one or two deployments with, uh, you know, to start looking for what's next, you know, if I, yeah. And, uh, and, and so, you know, that kind of acted a little bit of, as a catalyst to, to sort of look for something else knew that I wanted to continue on in the military, but you know, it's probably time and I was getting pretty long in the tooth at JBLM also to, you know, <laughs> stay there. So yeah, people start looking at you when you, uh, when you occupy a base too long there, the guys who do the assignments yeah. are like, wait a minute, this guy's been here. I, I, I kind of fell into that trap too. So yeah, I know what you mean. It's funny, you know, you like just kind of hang out and you're like, you know, it's, it's probably time. And you know, my wife was from Washington, so she wasn't against it, but it was going to be an event, you know, to leave her family. And, um, but we just kind of felt like it was a, like the right time to slow down the tempo a little bit. And, sure. you know, I had gotten, uh, I had gotten, you know, couple of nicks and injuries and stuff like that along the way. And it was, uh, it was just like, uh, you know, seeing those things, probably time to maybe look for something a little bit, uh, a little bit less dynamic, you know, after sure. that. so, uh, we ended up, so, I, so a, a special duty assignment, I guess, if you would say comes available where we were, where we would be assigned, uh, you know, a couple of us, me and another guy, we would be assigned basically to uh, to do combat development stuff, but we would sort of do it on behalf because a lot of times you get the, the you know the, the super cool guys up there at at Fort Bragg or Fort you know Fort Liberty, and they would they would be able to acquire and get these things very quickly that were you know because they had certain um, authorizations and ways that they could procure things, and so uh, and then you would have the 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 rest of the sort of you know, conventional soft that would have to sort of go through traditional acquisition process. Right. And so the thought was with building this bridge is that we could do, you know, kind of what we call a national theater transition a little bit faster. So get that gear, get the essay of what it is, TTPs and gear and, and equipment and act as a bridge to get that um, down to, you know, the, the forces, you know, still within SOCOM, but just to have different acquisition authorities just based off you know, mission and what they need to do. So, um, so anyway, that, that sort of is the, was the mission statement of it. You know, I don't think that it was overly successful to accomplish that because there's just bureaucracy and they're going to let you buy and budgets are a real thing. And so, right. you know, it started gravitating towards, we were really just focusing and I, we were, we were stationed up at the, at the air force unit at, at Bragg there. And so, really just focusing on their requirements and trying to procure, you know, things and, and ended up being like a commodity lead to, uh, to do a lot of the night vision, laser target designator stuff. And, and, and most of that stuff focused in like the visual augmentation stuff. So, you know, new NVGs and, and, uh, you know, new lasers and precision target stuff and things like that. So, 
it was awesome. And, uh, you know, being able to get it as, as so uncool as it sounds to go from, <laughs> you know, Ranger platoon JTAC to acquisition weenie, you know, or, you know, <laughs> acquisition subject matter expert, you know, and it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but to, I'll tell you, it was, it was one of the most valuable jobs that I had in the military. You know, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't cool and sexy by any means, but you know, for people that are looking to transition and build some relationships, you know, there's a reason a lot of these guys, I always tell these guys getting out or, you know, coming up on retirement or getting out a little bit early, like, you know, I know it's not cool, but focusing in on some force mod or CDD time, it really pays dividends, you know, and it really actually just allows you to kind of get there and meet some people and get your name out there and show your worth and, you know, get smart on a technology that you could maybe transition out and be, you know, affiliated with the company on the backside of that, you know, so, yeah. so, you know, it was a, it was a cool uh, experience, obviously get to play with a lot of the, you know, cool new toys, uh, but, you know, it's kind of just a standard assignment lasted a few years and, and then uh, an opportunity kind of, well, well I, I, you know, we did one, uh, did a couple of deployment, uh, one deployment out of that while I was there just doing some combat validation stuff of some, uh, some terminally guided, uh, you know, UAV stuff. So, you know, we went out there and the plan was we were going to go out and show some of these, so show some of these international partner force guys that we could, you know, do this and then pal around with them on a mission and hopefully, you know, break one out. And, and so it was me and me and another awesome tech T I, I won't say his name. Cause, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then a couple other controllers and a weather guy uh, that was out there with us. So this, this, you know, this kind of small team, and it was just the, it was like one of those where you just look around and you're like, what are we doing here? You know, like you're kind of <laughs> on your way out there, like who goat roped us into this situation? So, and I mean, you know, it was like I think I think one or two of them, including myself, were like, you know, re-enlisting and stuff. So you know, there's like yeah, the yeah. reason you're like, this is real stupid to do, though. You know, <laughs> so we go up there and. Uh, you know, you have to show, we were going to show them. So we have these, you know, we have 50 or 60 dudes out on this hilltop uh, of these Brits that were, you know, cool guy Brits, you know, and they're out there and we're all sitting in, we're, we're up at pretty high elevation and it, the wind is just kicking pretty hard. And so we're like, we don't know how this thing is going to do in this elevation and wind and stuff, <laughs> you know? So, so we try and, uh, we take this little trainer out and, uh, and the guy, so, so, so the weather guy, I won't say his name either, but it, you know, he's a great dude, but so he takes this, this trainer out to show you, you know, to show what, uh, what it can do. So he's going to launch it, but the thing's got the propeller on the back. Cause it's not the actual one. Cause we wanted to see like, well, this thing drive and fly decent in this elevation before we go and waste one of these with an sure. actual, you know, munition on it and stuff. So, so he, he chucks this thing and doesn't really clear it with his hand and that prop comes over his hand and just chews his hand up right there in front oh, of everybody. No. You know? And so it just sounds oh, like my God. Like a, sounds like you put a T bone in a blender, you know, and you're like, oh, <laughs> this you know. Jeez. So the thing it's like barely makes it up and, and he's trying to like play it off and he's like, you know, putting it in his pocket and shaking it. I'm like, dude, you know, it just sounded terrible. <laughs> and just from the background, you know, you get the British dude, he's like, you ain't walking that one off, mate, you know, and everyone's like <laughs> laughing, and it's just like, we're just like the four Air Force nerds there, just like, this is our airplane, you know, this one guy's <laughs> lost his hand, and it's so funny, you know, so. we. Get How bad was the injury, there. like, was it, did he lose fingers, I, or is he just kind of He had to go with? back, he had to go back to Longstool and get surgery, I'll say, oh so God. yeah, it was, it was bad enough, he almost lost his fingers. Oh, they weren't geez. off, but oh my god, it chewed, it chewed them up bad. And oh, so so that was like literally that whole deployment. You know, then then just you know trying to get this thing and showing it. And finally, we're like, cut it off. You know, cut it off. We're done here. <laughs> so, so one of that was just one of the funny things. It was like just kind of Keystone cops running around <laughs> trying to trying to show somebody to use this stupid little UAV thing. So it's pretty funny, but. 
you know, looking back now, you think about what the battlefield looks like with all of these things now. So it's kind of interesting. Oh, the, yeah. The evolution. But, uh, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty funny story. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't think it's funny. but No, probably not. <laughs> he's, he's a good We do laugh. We have laughed about it since. So it's a, oh, yeah, I'm sure it's yeah. funny now. But at the time, it's probably. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was not. It was not. The Brits loved it. I'll tell you that. Though. They oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, it was pretty fun. So, yeah. So after that, uh, you know, that was a very quick thing. Got that done, and then and then we went out to. Uh, I, I put in another selection, and and basically just went to another unit within the command that would that, that kind of just focuses on a little bit more of the you know some of the more recce stuff and preparation of a battlefield and things like that prior to a conflict and. And uh, my role in that was really strictly, you know, make sure that the operators were trained up as like a JTAC program manager. And then I just worked some of the other, uh, you know, special project stuff as far as, you know, development and, and just doing some of those things for advanced TTPs as it pertained to fires and that style of a mission and how okay. we would kind of get after that kind of thing. So um, really in, in a very, you know, strict support role for, for a lot of that piece. Um, but then got an opportunity to fall in and go do some of the strike cell stuff after that at, uh, you know, this is right when ISIS was kicking off and they had just pushed over and taken, taken Mosul. Um, and, you know, we kind of, there'd kind of been an operation going to do this more remotely, but they made a decision like, we're going to go, you're going to go forward and we're going to, uh, you know, set up an actual strike cell that uh is gonna then you know just just pave the way down to get down to Raqqa where that was pretty much the, the stronghold but uh you know getting in that seat and being able to do that for a for a deployment was you know it was it was actually one of the most stressful things that I have done in deployment because uh you know you're so remotely located and you're just sitting in a you know you're sitting in a in a jock uh and you think you have great essay but you know uh, the volume of aircraft and munitions that were being used, you know, and we were just doing it in 12 hour shifts. So you would just wake up and if weather was good, you could assume that you're going to drop bombs for 12 hours and then go sleep. And then you, you know, rinse and repeat for, for 45 days or, you know, whatever it turned out to be like, you know, it, you leave there and you feel like you're in when, when it, you were doing that much to try and deconflict the air and you're trying, sure. you know, and, you know that there's Americans also in contact there. And so you can't have anything that's, you can't just sling it, you know, it, right. as much as you want, because there's, there, you know, our forces are there, our partner forces are there. And uh, so it was just very detailed and pretty high stress as far as, you know, just not wanting to screw up, you know, right. and, um, and, and it wears on you. And I don't think people, you know, you always see like the, xbox controller metal and a lot of these people that are doing some of these missions it's, it's highly dynamic there's a lot of stress that goes along with just uh you know doing that from the air from even if it's from a tv screen you don't have to really be getting shot at to you know have the stress of wanting to do your job uh flawlessly you know oh so, for sure i mean you got that mental stress i mean when you're out on target you know you got your you got your radio in your back, you're walking around, you're doing stuff. It's kind of like, it's a more, it's, it's almost a distraction from the mental anguish of it. But if you're just sitting in a chair exactly. and that's all you have to do is just think about what you're doing. I mean, that's, yeah, I could be super stressful. It, it was interesting. And I, something I never thought it would be, it'd be like, oh, we're just, you know, we're just slinging bombs and it's good. But uh, <laughs> the, you know, so that compared to everything that I had done, you know, which I had, I had felt in my mind was a lot of, you know, kinetic JTACery and a lot of, you know, situations to drop, but quite a few amount of bombs, you know, from the ground and things like that and do my job, I guess I should say, you know, uh, you know, in that short amount of 45 days or whatever, you know, we surpassed that. 200 fold you know what i have right. done up to that point like it <laughs> it was such a ridiculous amount to be able to you know because we had about 400 miles you know 400 square miles was the raws you know that we we controlled it was basically the whole whole country of of syria yeah. and so it was just there's always something going on sure you know and so if it wasn't east it would be west and you know our main objective was just to just to lay the groundwork to let the let the SDF those those guys push down and finally get in around Raqqa and 
um, you know, take that over. But, uh, you know, it was a lot of, it was a lot of, of, you know, learning some coordinated attacks and things like that. And kind of, you know, I think you start to generate your own, uh, not your own, but like a, a mission like that almost dictates its own TTPs in a lot of ways. And it sure. kind of changes the way and you, you, you could see that evolve over time. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, there was a fair amount of negative press about, you know, uh, us going and doing that mission. And, uh, because it was, you know, it was at the end of the day, it was, you know, it, it was, it was some command that was basically saying, you know, you eight or 10 guys in a, in a rotational form, you know, not the same eight or 10, but you know, you're, we're going to take eight or 10 guys and we're going to put them in a room and they're going to clear the way, you know, against an entire, you know, ISIS threat that is, that has, you know, taken over almost, you know, two countries and threatening to take over Iraq. They were pretty worried about it at that point. Yeah. And so unfortunately when they're dug in like that, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of munitions that you have to drop and it, you know, it's, it starts to look like you're, you know, uh, that, that civilians are not, you know, your number one priority and the collateral damage starts to take its toll, you know, as we see on the news today even, but, uh, yeah. you know, it, that you lose that message really fast in like, unless you're <laughs> as careful as humanly possible. Right. And so which adds to the stress uh, you're talking about, because it's not just, <laughs> you're not just like, you're not just yeah. carpet bombing things. You've yeah. got to like it's got to be precise and you have to have the, your facts. And yeah, that's got every be fact has to be straight. And, you know, we we got to a point where it was very optimized and we had, you know, we would talk to the authorities that would give us the final. But, you know, we'd have to build a brief for each one and basically give you know, exact everything from the ROE to what we've seen to all this to develop this, you know, package to then be approved. And, uh, you know, so it was uh, quite a process, but, you know, you, we were able, to, I think that model was very effective to stop, you know, a force like, you know, ISIL, you know, was, was moving like that. I think that they, that was very effective because they were pretty dug in and they had some serious strongholds. So, yeah. Oh, could you imagine if like we sent, Instead of you guys doing that, we sent in a bunch of troops to try to, it, you know, take them out. It, it would have like been only... a disaster. Yeah, for you sure. You know, it would have just been another piece of terrain with more IEDs and more just battle space footprint and, right. you know, lingering. And, and this way, you know, we were able to take a lot of the casualties off of, you know, the Americans. We obviously had you know, some of our best there, uh, that were pushing them dudes along, Yeah. yeah. but, you know, have being able to have an actual decent fighting force that we could, we could believe in. And, you know, the, and, and the Kurds there, I think that they're unbelievable people. I, I think that they're warriors at heart and, uh, and they're just, that you know, they're good people, you know, for whatever it's worth, what we've, how we've treated them versus not treated them. You know, we've, right. They're great. They're great warriors. And so we are, uh, we are basically, just uh, at this point, we are, uh, you know, pushing all, all the way down that way and, and uh, getting them to a point uh, and not not maximizing any casualties as much as possible on either side of it. But getting the getting the SDF involved in those guys were was pretty great, pretty great decision to do that. So nice. Yeah. So, you know, I from there, I think. Uh, so that, you know, that went, that went all pretty successful. And I left right about the time that they were actually getting right to the, to the point. And, you know, I think, you know, the rest of the story, it all went uh, pretty smooth as, as we could expect at this right. point. But um, that was kind of the point where I came back and started, you know, I was experiencing some of the things from injuries and stuff like that and trying to get, uh, trying to get to where I'm deciding at this point, I had done, a lot of the things that I wanted to accomplish, I had only really been in the military for about 12 years, 11 and a half or 12 years at this point. And I'm just thinking like, you know, am I going to be fulfilled? Am I going to be a good leader if I kind of go and, you know, run through the paces for the next seven years of, you know, and think about the good old days of, you know, doing all this stuff. So uh, that was kind of compounded by a lot of like injury stuff that I was dealing with just with, you know, my back. And I think just the, the normal extremity things had just taken too much of a toll and a couple of bad jumps that just, you know, that you don't really give that stuff time to heal. And right. Uh, so the writing was on the wall that, you know, I was going to have to make a decision to, 
kind of, you know, try and hang it up or bring up some of these medical things that I was facing versus, uh, you know, kind of just gut it out for seven more years and probably not be happy. I didn't know what the next type of unit and, you know, kind of going through the last seven, eight years of that career and, you know, the thought of, am I going to be able to relate to some, you know, to these limitations, not limitations, but am I going to be able to relate to the mission? Am I even going to be able to bring something back if I go to, a, you know, a conventional, uh, you know, ASOS? And, you know, I felt like I would almost be doing a disservice in some ways and bringing a chip on my shoulder if I were to kind of go back and, and do that. That's probably not the yeah. right answer, but, you know, that's kind of the, the honest answer that I felt. But, on, you know? I mean, yeah, being honest is, is key. I mean, uh, you know, it's not for everybody, you know, going – have, some people can transition back, and we've had I keep phenomenal. I've had phenomenal leaders on here that have done that very thing and and been super uh, integral and and uh, you know at the wing and and higher levels, Magcom levels. Um, but that's not for everybody, you know. Not everybody can do that. And, yeah, and, and I felt like I could potentially like I, I knew that I always wanted to stay affiliated and helping and supporting the guys, but it was mainly just uh, I wanted to. Maybe I could be there to help people transition and do that from the other side and, and those sure. types of things as well. So, it, you know, it, it was pretty clear. And and I got to a point where I got offered the ability uh, to where it became real, because I think when we all decide if we're going to get out of the military or not, like we're institutionalized men. You know, that that is there's no joke about that. We've right. enjoyed a, an interesting security blanket and the thoughts of like, you know, kind of leaving that is pretty terrifying, especially if you know that you have it and, and like, this is not the risky move, I guess. So, you know, we're, we're sort of in a way we look, uh, we're kind of institutionalized and, and, sure. and luckily I had some great mentors that were, that really took the time to break it down and says like, you know, uh, here's how this, you know, works. If you were to like, you know, get out and, and get a job and doing these things and afforded me a lot of opportunities, you know, again, be, because of the relationships that I had and the experiences that I was able to have in some of those jobs, uh, you know, and ironically, it's kind of the nerdy acquisition job that allowed me to uh, have a little bit of that network and, and meet some people and get an opportunity to, to you know, transition into the next piece of, uh, of my life. So yeah. it made it it made it where I didn't look back and I didn't I didn't worry or, or think, you know, I'm. I'm giving up or it was a, it was easy for me to kind of not associate my identity as a person with being a soft tech P, you know, sure. like it, it kind of, it kinda, I think, I think a lot of people struggle with that. And, and I, I do still, you know, to this day, obviously, but uh, being able to say like, this is not my identity uh, when you're going to the next phase of your life or transitioning out of the military, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to, to not want to hold on to. And, think like, am I going to be, you know, the man that I want to be, uh, down the road if I don't have this to hang my hat on, or if I'm not, you know, super cool guy, uh, doing all this stuff. So, and the oh, answer yeah. is yes. Yeah. You know, that's sure. the thing is I try to tell a lot of guys like there's, trust me, there's a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I know it's a scary thing to make that decision to transition, but there is a whole nother life waiting uh that's not to get people to leave the military early in any stretch <laughs> right. or anything you know that's i i couldn't couldn't have more respect for people that do their time and and uh you know retire at, at full full pace but uh it's just you know it's good to let people know transitioning because it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time in your life trying to decide what to do with it you know oh for sure so. i mean we're all different and not every path is the same for everybody i mean some guys some guys keep operating all the way until the end and some, you know, but not everybody can do that. And there's not, frankly, there's not enough opportunities for everyone to do that. You know, there's not, you know, and you can't, not everyone can do this. You have to accept that. Yeah. You crushed it. You were operating, you got after it, you know, when you did, but now it's time to do something else. I mean, there, you know, and if you still need some sort of, you know, excitement or something, you know, you'd be a cop or a firefighter, or there's all kinds of opportunities yeah. to do different things. Yeah. But if you're looking to settle down and you have a family and, you know, you want to be around more and you want to make some money, you know, you're the route that you're, you're in talking about, you know, like networking and, you know, kind of figuring out the business side of it is, is probably yeah. a better way to go. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it became very right with me. 
to to make that decision and go to go that route so um you know i was trying to uh trying to work through that but uh you know luckily to the to the next transitioning piece with 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 the company that i'm at now and the viasat job uh that i picked up you know i was able to do a lot of this with um some of the things that we were doing with, uh, you know, the data link radios and kind of getting that miniaturized and, and into the digitally aided cast world. I was early, you know, in there early enough to get exposed to, to that. So, um, yeah. and then basically just, uh, I made a great transition into it. So then right when that was getting fielded, they, uh, they would take that and we would, you know, go around and do all the training. And as they were fielding that and, uh, you know, the company as a whole, we just, we sort of built on that and, uh, we were able to kind of form and, and luckily Maddie green and some of these old hat tactics, not to say Maddie's old hat, but you know, some of these old, <laughs> old guard, you know, tacti guys, we were able to sort of just make a, uh, a team. And we had a lot of capability to just say, you know, what's your team going to look like? And, and Maddie and I, Maddie had been out for a little bit, so he had some, you know, street cred, and he knew sort of the ins and outs of what we wanted to do, and you know, the pitfalls, and so he was just an awesome mentor to help, you know, through that. And I was able to do a fellowship, uh, you know, and and get the ins and outs of the job and stuff like that before actually getting out. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so then you know we we were able to get this team of you know, pretty much comprised of all of these fantastic dudes that were, that were getting out and retiring and, and just, uh, you know, put this awesome, awesome group of dudes together with, you know, Nick and, and Bert and all of these awesome guys that were just getting out. And, uh, so it's been an incredible experience. Uh, it's had its ups and downs and we, you know, we, we've kind of always worked through that, but, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate to be able to kind of look at a career that I can give back to, you know, our, my peer group is now chiefs and, you know, senior leadership. And so, right. um, you know, that all goes into the decision-making too, of, of trying to decide if it's right to get out or right to stay in. But, uh, you know, I, I think that we can still support the guys. I have a, you know, we have a personal connection with these, with these people now, because these are literally our, you know, our brothers and our peer group. And now they're, they're responsible for their dudes that are younger at this point. And so, you know, we're, it's like you have an obligation and a responsibility to them to, to make the right stuff and to, and to act, act like, you know, you can, you know, just make, make sure that things are what they say you are because your friends are, uh, are out there using it for potentially. So, right. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of how that's come. I, I sort of, decided uh you know had an opportunity to do some of the sales and you know business development stuff and that's been uh it's been a great experience to get that piece of it you know i'm not a traditional you know business sales you know capture guy uh, right, right. but i think you, i think it's important to take a tack when you're it, at the end of the day you know i've had a lot, a lot of couple great mentors that have just said like you know whatever you lack, you know, if you do a couple of core things, if you try to solve someone's problem and you build a relationship with them, you know, and then you try to solve it wholeheartedly, you're going to, you're going to have them come back at, the next time they have a problem, you know? Sure. And, uh, and so I, I never really look at it a lot as, as selling anything, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really one that wants to sell a widget or do that. Like I kind of want to sell a capability and a, and a relationship you sure. know, or, or a problem solving piece. And that that's, that's a good tact. I think that we've been successful to sort of, um, you know, help our, help our war fighters out. And, uh, yeah, I think it's been good for the company and, and our little team, you know, so. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, everything you guys have done has, uh, directly contributed to the war effort, you know, like the, I mean, that, that handheld link 16 thing was just, it's kind of revolutionized the way we do stuff, you know, frankly, I mean, uh, hopefully try to put it, make a couple of steps, you know, in the right direction. And it's certainly been a few steps forward and a few, and a few steps back. But, uh, yeah. I think, I think that it's giving us the ability, you know, and all of those capabilities, I think they're starting to put the ground, uh, perspective a little bit more in the spotlight of, uh, you know, it is important for all of these fantastic strategic assets to, you know, mingle and, and be interoperable with flesh and blood where the rubber meets the road, you know, right. and not, you know, we always talk machine to machine, but like, 
we're always going to have some some squishies on the ground, you know, that need to be as interoperable and and uh, be able to communicate with with all of these, you know, exquisite solutions that we have in the air and, and on, on the water and things like that. So sure. Yeah, definitely. Hey, did you want to talk about the um, the Honor Foundation? Yeah, no, I it, I would love to, I, and I don't want to make a free ad for them or or do anything that uh, <laughs> they they don't approve of. So I don't I don't speak for them. I just think that uh, I think that we don't do enough as as guys uh, and, and girls getting out. Uh, we don't do enough for those that are coming after us and asking these questions and like trying to uh you know build them up give them the information increase their network uh i think that we can always do a little bit better to do that and i think the honor foundation is a great outlet to do that of course there's there's a lot of them out there um that's just been one that i've been fortunate enough to be able to kind of uh you know help out do some of these uh mock interview things and and help out with fellowships and getting people some internships at viasad and things and a lot of these outlets uh you know, it, it's great to see the amount of people in in the workforce that are giving back and seeing the value in a lot of these, you know, service members getting out. Uh, I think that we can all look in the mirror each day and, you know, you get a guy or a girl that's asking you, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I kind of get it every once, every week, every two weeks if someone just, you know, it's not looking for a job. I think it's just looking for a little bit of what do I do now or I'm thinking about getting out and uh you know, we've been able to run through this about seven or eight or nine times with, with, with folks getting fellowships and transitioning, you know, whatever their process, if it's retirement, if it's medical boarding and you know, things like that. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a passion of, of that I like to do. I really like to, you know, show people that there are options, you know, uh, and then just the basic things you don't learn in the military, like right. what is, you know, negotiating a salary? What is a benefits package? What is, you know, none of these things come to you when you're, when you're in, really in the military. And so some of those things to just, you know, have a conversation about what to expect, understanding your worth while still being, uh, humble, you know, uh, yeah. not to not to oversell or undersell your, yourself when it comes to the, the value you might think you bring a company. And um, and I, again, I, I'm no expert in it, but I can I can see what others have, have showed me and what I've experienced. And I think that it's a great uh, it's a great way that you can give back without a ton of your time or, or, or anything is, you know, find a person that that is getting out or may want your support or may want your advice and just, you know, have a conversation and try to give them a little tidbit of just the things that maybe you learned when you were getting out. And uh, I think that's, uh, it's been pretty fulfilling for me. And, uh, yeah. you know, honor foundation does that they're, they're expanding and they, they do an incredible job to really give people transition, you know, like, you know, professional transitioning advice, you know, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's important for, cause like you said, I mean, the, we are just, we're so, ing and you mentioned the, the term institutionalized, we, you know, things are just given to us and we're told what to do and, you know, we're paid whatever Congress says we should be paid and not yeah. having the skills to like kind of break out of that mold and be like, well, wait a minute, uh, you, let's talk about days off, you know, let's talk about pay time off and that kind of thing. Cause if we just yeah. accept whatever they give us, you know, but you can negotiate all that stuff. And, and, and the thing that I realized they're more than willing to give it to you. You know, they're going to, they're definitely going to lowball you. Not, not in a disrespectful way, but they're going to be like, look, I am going to, this is what I want to pay my employees, but they're willing to go so much higher and do so much more for you. You just have to ask for it. I mean, they're not, you know, these employee, excuse me, these employers, they, they see the, the value in these military guys getting out and they want them on their team. Uh, but you kind of have, you have to ask for it too. You, it's not just going to, they're going to give you what they're going to give you unless you ask for it. So that, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, I think the value is there, uh, and in just those, those athletes, you know, you kind of, I kind of call them just athletes. Like it doesn't yeah. matter what you're going to ask all of these people that we've had the opportunity to kind of handpick and interview, but like, it's just, if, if something needs done one, they're going to have the initiative to do it. Right. And two, you could teach them damn near anything, you know, brain surgery, <laughs> right. if they had enough time, you know, they're going to figure it out. <laughs> right. And that's, that's the mentality that, uh, you know, you, you, 
that's what I always would look for. And that's what, you know, I think is very effective in these kind of, you know, small teams that are dealing with the, with the government is like, you know, the ability to, or the drive to go a little bit above and beyond and, and figure it out, you know, uh, it brings a lot of value. So, so I think, you know, companies, they are seeing that more and more. And of course they have a business and they have costs and they have, uh, and that's always butted up against, you know, revenue. And so it's, it's a, it's a max, but, you know, understanding your value and, and advocating being your best advocate is really, uh, you know, things that a lot of people don't learn in the military, right. you know, sure. you don't come away all the time with that, with that, you know, piece of advice. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, man, this has been great. I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. This, uh, I, it was so fascinating how a lot of guys, um, you know, go through kind of your same, path you know a lot of guys have had on here um but the fact that you kind of you you made the decision to cut it a little short and then kind of that business side of it is is kind of where I'm, i'd like i want to expose people to as well you know I, I i definitely want to hear everybody's good stories but having a little nugget of information like a guy like you who is real successful in the military but also has made some successes or has been successful when you got out as well i mean i think it's very valuable for these guys who like you said and like kind of what we were talking about, not everybody stays in for 30 years and uh, not, you know, and uh, yeah. I think this is kind of, we need to have outlets for those who don't feel comfortable doing all that time. You know, there are good guys that we need to stay in, you know, like the Marty Clucas yep. and, the, and the Kenny Lindsay's, there are invaluable people that have really shaped the, the community and the Air Force as a whole. But there's also other guys that just, they're not, that's not them. They're not going to do that. And having another outlet is, is valuable. So I, I can't thank you enough for, for imparting that knowledge onto everybody and kind of giving people another avenue to another option, you know, as opposed to just staying in the whole time. So, and if anybody, you know, if there's anything that anyone, you know, if I can offer uh, help, advice, advocacy, uh, you know, network, uh, you know, you know exactly where to reach out. So uh, I'm more than happy to do that for anybody trying to transition and just ask a few questions. So right on more than happy. Yeah. Good deal. So, all right, man. Well, well thank like you, said, man. Let me say thank you too, also, because you are you. You know, you put this on with all of these incredible guys. Uh, you know that, that that come before me, and uh, you know, someone needs to turn the mic around on you because you know you're the type of guy that we've uh, we've we have all. You know, the younger generation of this, you know, has uh, we looked up to the you know the you and, and 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 all the other guys before, and you know Zach and and all of these awesome you know legends of their time, and so. Uh, you know, I want to say thank you. And it's, it's very humbling to be able to even have a conversation with, with all of these, you know, association with these folks. So including well, yourself, you deserve it, man. You, you, you're right up there with them. You've, you've done your time and you did it well and you crushed and, uh, you know, you should, you're, you're in my mind, you're, you're up there with everybody. So I, yeah, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. <laughs> it's been great talking to you. Thank you. You too, man. All right. All uh, right. yeah. Uh, take care and uh, keep in touch and, uh, I'll, I'll uh, talk to you later. Will do. Thanks, brother.